just before beginning, it just it was a pleasure working with Father uh, Michael and Aya when he was in Canada, and uh, we had some wonderful memories, and just want to thank him for all his help. I'd like to uh, just t- to talk to you about, we have a new book coming out, and it's not something we really planned. The book, What Has Happened to the Catholic Church, was going to be reprinted, but there are so many things that happened in the last 20 um, some years that we had to do a complete rewrite. So it's going to be called Counterfeit Catholicism and the Masterminds of Vatican II. People are, when are you going to get it out? Well, I've been working on it four years, and it's about 300 pages. It's eight and a half by 11, so there's a lot in there. And uh, we're just finishing Vatican II. Father and I are finishing up the sacraments, and we just have a few more things, so hopefully before Christmas. Um, You can go ahead and get the other one now. So there's a lot of information We'll be going kind of quickly because there's a lot involved. There's a lot of people. Uh, We'll probably cover about 150 people and from all different countries all over the world. So in order to make it reasonable, we want to just use um, uh, some charts. So I'll just uh, actually you can follow along a little bit here. Oops. Okay. I'll just get started. But. Um, But this is going to tell you who, what, when, where, and why, uh, how Vatican II all came about. So counterfeiting is an art that requires a mastermind with great skill, incredible patience, and his ultimate aim is power. Counterfeiters care little if anyone gets hurt in the process. Millions were deceived and lost their faith as a result of his Satan's masterpieces, Vatican II and the counterfeit church. He couldn't be happier since his goal is the loss of immortal souls. Vatican II and the modern church are not merely counterfeits, but something intrinsically evil. Loss of faith, invalid mass and sacraments, heretical teachings and traitorous leadership are definitely not the work of the Holy Spirit. Evil spirits created this anti-church managed by anti-popes that will one day be headed by anti-Christ in mutiny against God, virtue, and morality. The humanist counterfeit church of today focuses on the deification of man, not the glory of God, on the here and now, not the hereafter, and on helping people's bodily needs, not their spiritual ones. It is evil to the core. We can have nothing to do with it. Sin today is viewed as an offense against society, not God. Lamentably, according to current societal standards, actions are probably okay if no one got caught or hurt in the process. Society and the modern church tolerate things that were once universally considered deadly mortal sins. Pornography, premarital sex, adultery, Abortion, divorce, euthanasia, suicide, cremation, and drug, alcohol, and gambling addictions. Other evils include gossip, sarcasm, lying, rash judgment, detraction, calumny, deceit, perjury, embezzlement, keeping stolen property. These are all justified today if the occasion warrants it. How could millions of Catholics throughout the world laity, religious, and clergy join the counterfeit church. Since everything looked official, multitudes blindly followed their leaders. Although the modern church looks legitimate, the difference lies in belief and worship. Modernist theologians replace Catholic beliefs with heretical teachings and the mass and sacraments with counterfeits. The devil, knowing Frail human nature realizes people follow the path of least resistance. A school that promised students no homework would be sought by a lot of underachievers. And a church that had no rules, well, millions would flock to it. But the Catholic Church offers something very important. The means of grace, high morals and immutable beliefs. It alone fills the soul. Millions of Catholics succumbed to modernist fatal attraction because it acted like a powerful narcotic, muting conscience and allowing people to do as they please. The modern church removes individual accountability. People now determine right and wrong for themselves. 
So what I'd like to go over right now, these are the three main enemies of the Catholic Church. Freemasonry, founded in England in 1717, spread to Belgium, France, and the entire world. And it's based on rebellion against God and his laws. It denies the supernatural and aims at creating a one world, new world order. Atheistic communism was founded by Marx and Engels, took root in Russia in 1917, and it aims at creating a tyrannical ruling class and enslaving people. Destroys religion, especially Catholicism, and then you have modernism founded by Loisy, Tyrell, von Harnack. Aims at liberating man from God and his laws, it's do-it-yourself religion. Individuals make the final determination of right and wrong, and it ultimately leads to atheism. That's what the goal is. So what's really interesting in John Paul II's coat of arms, if you've ever seen it, it's, there's a cross that's off-center, and then there's the letter M. It's kind of like the M from Michigan, uh, their logo, uh, but it's, um, it's not, I'm not against Michigan, I live there. So, uh, But um, it's kind of a takeoff from that, but it's not a very nice-looking M. Normally, the... Uh, for someone here had a pen with it. It has an A with an M in it. Ave Maria, the letter A and then the M, Old English. Ave Maria, and it has a crown on top. But what he has is kind of interesting. It has, besides having the shield there, it has the papal tiara, but it looks like a pyramid. And you can almost see the cross on it as the all-seeing eye. I'm not trying to make this up. If you look at it, uh, it's actually quite interesting. But, you know, the M doesn't stand for Mary. He didn't love Our Lady. You ever see him really praying the rosary? I mean, he has those things, you know, that um, he's looking at people and things like that, but uh, devout. M for Marxism, Modernism, and Masonry. Those were his loves of his heart. That's what he lived for. That's what he spread throughout the world. So... How did this all come together? The only thing, you can't understand how this great apostasy occurred unless you put those three together. So Detroit, our economy is built on the big three, Ford, GM, and Chrysler. But the big three with the devil, masonry, modernism, and Marxism. So it's, uh, you know, and if you get the allurement of power, celebrity status, and wealth, who's not going to want to be part of it? I mean, a secret society, that does have an allurement in itself. And then Freemasonry is worldwide, so it had networks everywhere. Their tentacles could, uh, could keep track on church conditions, know how to infiltrate best, know who's weak, things like that. And they had the Oaks of Secrecy, so they had Brother Masons, Brothers of the Craft, help them go higher in the church, and they kept it quiet. They had an oath. Now... Also, their goal was to put somebody on the throne of Peter, but if you had four million members, you know, you give a couple hundred years, it's not that far-fetched. They almost had Rompola, a Freemason, become Pope under the reign of, right, that when Pope Pius, St. Pius X was elected, so that was like a dress rehearsal. So they almost had one, you know, just wait another 60, 70 years, and uh, that's where John the Twenty-Third came in. So communists want to neutralize the church because the church r fights for the rights of people. And that's something that the church has always done in individuals and promises heaven. But communists are really good at mind control. They can control the masses. They know how to do that. So how can you rule countries all over the world without being right there? So they use misinformation, half-truths, intimidation, and they're very successful. Also, they found eager recruits just like the Masons did. And, um, you know, if you want to be a priest, here, we got connections. You know, we can get you. You like to be a bishop? That's not too hard. And it's happened. It's not just something far-fetched. Now, modernism is based on doubt and skepticism, and it destroys faith from within. So it has a semblance of religion, but it's like an empty shell. There's nothing there. And if you really think of it, th there is nothing in modernism. There's no one belief all modernists throughout the world have. Sure, there's some believe in vital eminence, like God within. Some believe is, you know, you can do what you want with your beliefs. But it's basically do-it-yourself religion. And so the devil loved this. You know, offer people what they want. 
You know, they don't want any rules. They don't want to worship God. You know, love yourself. Hey, modernism fits the bill perfectly. So this brought about the great apostasy. Freemasonry, atheistic communism, and modernism. Now, this is kind of interesting. You have to do this in a marketing scheme. I thought of this. You know, Freemasonry was like the Satan's research and development team. They said, what do, you know, what do uh, people want? So you got lodges all over the world. It wouldn't be that hard to get together. And then communism was their marketing and advertising division. Okay? They get the product out. And then modernism, they distribute it to the masses. And they claim that, you know, it's a miracle religion. It heals all of mankind's ills and allows people to do what they please. And you have peace on earth. I mean, what could be better? Let's go back 500 years. Martin Luther, John Calvin, Cramner, Knox, they started the Protestant religion. So what were they? Attacks against the mass, the sacraments, the visible church, and a divinely established hierarchy. There was no need for prayer or good works either. So Vatican II is very similar. What do they attack? The exact same things. So what's interesting, too, with modernists and Protestants, there's no two of them that believe exactly the same. I mean, they can be close, and some people have the same training, but, you know, uh, ultimately there's not a whole lot that they believe alike. Now in the 1600s, you know, you don't think a whole lot's going on. Jansenius who started, basically his writing started the Jansenist heresy, that God was this tyrant, nobody could make it to heaven, that hardly anybody could, so don't even try, so you shouldn't pray, you shouldn't go to Mass, you shouldn't attend the sacraments. But that wasn't the end of it. It had a lot more. It brought doubt and despair throughout France. It was Calvinist in concept. It promoted predestination for the few and damnation for the rest. So, but what they did, the same as Vatican II, they discouraged prayer, reception, the sacraments, attendance at Mass. I mean, those aren't promoted much since Vatican II. So it's similar, isn't it? Also, they attack papal authority and papal infallibility. Most of you don't know, they established their own vernacular humanist religion. And it's quite interesting. We'll go into that in a little bit. So, you have a lot of saints fighting against them. St. Alphonsus Liguori, St. Louis Marie de Montfort, St. Paul Pius X, but it still was there. But what was interesting, if we come here to the quote, if Jansenism is distinguished among heresies for crafty proceedings, chicane, lack of frankness on a part of its adherents, especially its pretense of remaining Catholics without renouncing their errors. That's what modernism is. They have all kinds of erroneous beliefs, but they say they're Catholic. Staying in the church by skillful looting or braving with impunity decisions of the supreme authority of the church. You could say the past papal pronouncements. So history repeats itself. The Arians operated most of the churches in the east and west in the 4th century. Protestants had a lot of them in Europe during the 16th and modernists run them today. 1700s, this is a way of thinking and ideas affect people tremendously. There's so many names here, that's why we're showing this. It's just too hard to um, just to say all this. Like, who is that? Okay, John Locke promoted religious indifferentism. That was the same as Vatican II. Hume was an atheist who claimed life should be built on self-gratification. So that's exactly what we have, moral relativity. Morals are determined by you. Rousseau, he was the first person to use the word modernist. He was talking about an atheist philosopher. He saw all religions as equal, and they were all basically useless, and he wanted to get rid of inhibitions. Voltaire attacked the church terribly. He actually put, like, missiles in pews that were full of blasphemies. And so before he died, he some priest came to see him, and he, the priest told him to renounce the devil, and he said, it's not a good time to make new enemies. So um, he uh, promoted immorality. So the lazy fair attitude adopted by the modern church today, we see that, that all this stuff is tolerated, all these moral ills. The church cannot do that. Practical denial of original sin and concupiscence. So what happened in France? The church was persecuted. Under Saint, when St. John Vianney was a boy, they had mass in a barn. 
90% of the priests stayed faithful to the church. 10% joined a schismatic French church. But during that time, this is a real key important date, 1790, is when the uh, civil constitution of the clergy made the government choose the bishops. Now, that's about almost 200 years before Vatican II, 160 or whatever, 170. So, uh, you know, you get a lot of people in line and then their successors. So France, this is how they help get things going. So Freemasons and Modernists, you know, got their uh, places. And then when Vatican II came, the French bishops and cardinals were some of the leading Modernists. Okay, and uh, this is kind of interesting. The priests that remained faithful to the church were pe persecuted, exiled, or drowned. So when Pope Pius VI died, the French politicians and German freethinkers thought it was the end of the church. It was not to be. So the church, though it seemed impregnable, began to crumble. Okay, in the 1800s, the Freemasons started working in Italy. They took over the Papal States, they united Italy, but then the lodges had a lot more power. The church was not there to oversee things, so they infiltrated the church there. You got a couple hundred years to work on it. And what's interesting, uh, this is kind of unique, I was not aware of this either, but uh, Mazzini, Cavour, and Garibaldi, they spread the revolutionary ideas of Karl Marx. So here's Masons and Communists working together. Sometimes we think they're opposite ends of the spectrum. They're all partners. They're all part of the devil's team. So we go into Germany, the culture comp, the cultural struggle. This was under Bismarck. He wanted to destroy the church in the 1870s. So about even though 40% of the German population was Catholic, half the bishops and 2,000 priests were imprisoned or exiled. The Jesuits were also exiled, laity who helped the priests or bishops were thrown into jail. Over a million Catholics were deprived of the mass and one-fourth of all the parishes were abandoned. But this is where Germany gets, they got to get a part in this new council that's going to happen. So the government trains the priests, the seminarians. They have to be chosen by the government. They have to go to univers secular universities. People that are going to climb the ladder have to be with the government. So they had a little bit of time too, you know, about 100 years. I mean, you can do a lot in 100 years. So this was throughout a country, uh, then that's a lot. So these traitors to the faith, they trained successors. Uh, to Binchen, most of you have never heard us a whole lot except from Hans Kung. He taught there. But this really goes back to like the 1470s when it was founded and um, was there at the time of Martin Luther. Melanchthon uh, was there. Uh, these are a bunch of modernists that uh, we can come down a little bit. Uh, they've probably never heard of, but these were all people that prepared the way for modernism 100 years earlier. Moeller believed the church was a mystery and advocated a vernacular liturgy. Now, there's going to be names that you're not going to be familiar with, Chenu and Congar and all these others. These were all modernists of Vatican too, but they continued their work. Dre stressed evolution of dogma that was promoted at Vatican II. Graf and Hirscher were two others, and they wanted a vernacular liturgy, married clergy, a religion based on the Bible, and communion under both kinds. And three of those four, you know, were implemented with Vatican II. Kung, he said grace was not important, so did Brulliard, a modernist during the Vatican II era. Sheban believed the church was a mystery and um, something undefinable. That's the same thing what Leonard said, uh, who was a Freemason, and Vatican II adopted his idea of the church as a sacrament. Schmidt said dogma should be critically viewed in the light of history and scripture. He believed revealed dogmas, you know, we needed further analysis. We can't believe this, you know, we're educated people. So this is where all the doubting came in. Modernists are just like that. Gardini is very important. He wrote a book, The Spirit of the Liturgy, at the beginning of the 20th century. He was the mentor for Joseph Ratzinger. He was his professor. So, you know, the changes, basically, when they wrote the new mass, they just pulled out his book and, hey, there's some good ideas here. Let's start uh, using them. And look at, you know, he was born in 1885. So the Catholic Tabijnan 
theologians work with their Protestant counterparts at the same university. Vatican II, the theologians at Pariti, the modernist worked with the non-Catholic observers just exactly in parallel. Okay, architects of modernism. Kant was a Lutheran. He said divine revelation was impossible. And Lamennais was an excommunicated priest. He wanted ideas from the French Revolution brought into the church, but that's where we get false religious liberty from Courtney Murray. Shell advocated the universal priesthood of believers as something Congar, Lubach, and Rahner promoted. He called his people profess pre progressive Catholics, and that was exactly what was used in Vatican II. Look at this, 1848. Blondell was a layman. He believed in this vital elements, this inner force people had, opened them to the divine. He said there is no real difference between nature and grace. He's a lot like Pelagius, a heretic of the fourth century. And um, Congar de Lubach Chenu promoted his things in Vatican II. Von Harnick, now here's where we get the real architects of modernism, the three guys that put everything together. Von Harnick was in Berlin. He was a Protestant liberal theologian. He claimed that the church distorted the gospel teachings. He didn't believe in the divinity of Christ, didn't believe in the blessed trinity. He had this man, Jesus, founded some church. People gradually, you know, followed him. And, um, you know, it's just really wild. Barth was one of his pupils. You might not be familiar with this man, but he was one of the non-Catholic observers of Vatican II. Uh, Hans Kung wrote a dissertation on him, um, they printed a lot of his books in Germany and Switzerland, and uh, he helped found the World Council of Churches. So it's all coming together. Loisi was a French apostate priest. He believed the church was constantly changing. So dogma, there was nothing definite. You just kind of did it as time's gone on. And then he believed that popular opinion should uh, base things. He said St. John's gospel wasn't authentic. Come on, who was he? And uh, he put the opinions of theologians above what the church taught. His uh, beliefs were put into the doctrines, documents of Vatican II, the Constitution of Divine Revelation, thanks to Cardinals Al Frank Bea and Dan Nelu. So five of Loazi's books were put on the index. And uh, one of his friends was an apostate priest, uh, Hutton. He said um, 20 years ago he ceased to believe in the soul and free will and in the future life. I mean, what kind of person is he? And then on the next uh, paragraph here, Albert Hutton claimed that Loazi admitted in 1917 he was offering mass for 21 years before that. He did not believe in a, any personal or impersonal God in a future life or in anything supernatural or spiritual. Well, these are the, the architects of modernism. I mean, they really... Uh, unbelievable people, no faith at all. Tyrell was a convert from Calvinism and Anglicanism, and he lost his faith by reading Blondell, and he believed in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit among the laity, developing doc, uh, theologian, theology. He condemned dogma, uh, believed the papacy and hierarchy were human institutions, and called the church a sacrament. But it was interesting, the quote that he has here, that he said... Um, Modernism, there are as many different modernisms as there are modernist, and that's true. I mean, if you look at any of these people from Vatican II, they all believe different things. All they did is they attacked God and they attacked the church. So he believed every baptized person was an official missionary, and he um, was expelled from the Jesuits. I thought this is a really interesting thing. He's big on moral relativism. You know, everybody do what you want, popular opinion. That's how you determine morality. You know, if people want to do something evil, if everybody likes it, then let's, let's do it. Uh, he was expelled from the judge. What he said, he, well, he's still alive, that his heart was dead. So he was excommunicated, eventually became an agnostic. Uh, Loazi became basically an atheist. Uh, so it's uh, interesting. So these are the architects of modernism. Let's go in the 1900s. Now, this is... Um, what happened now, the writings of all these people started getting into seminaries, but this is the key thing here, these modernist writers. There's a lot of names here. Uh, when you get the book later, you're going to see how many people, but uh, there, it was just like a flood of articles and books and pamphlets and everything promoting all these modernist beliefs. 
since the 1920s and 30s. So they had 30 years to prepare everything. And so, you know, it's quite prolific. Now, here's what's interesting. The liturgical press in Minnesota, Deskley in Belgium, they help print a lot of this stuff. So um, it, uh, it really made it easy for them. And then all these Americans wanted to help with the efforts. So they translated things. Okay, so decades before Vatican II, the modernists replaced Catholic terms with modernist ones. So they changed the name of all the sacraments, liturgy of the word, liturgy of the Eucharist, and all that. And so it was just a gradual thing. And then con celebration, communion in the hand, presence in the community, Lord's Supper, all that. It's basically a lack of belief. We can go right to the bottom here. Uh, this is interesting. Some uh, English writer wrote, to me it seems if you remove from God all power to make any difference in the world, you don't believe in revelation, then you're not only a heretic but an atheist, atheist no matter how well you perform as a bishop. So kind of shows there's not much there. This is all really based on pride. Uh, basically these theologians could all become celebrities. People would want their autographs and it's going to be you know, like they could just finally be recognized in the world. The important part on here is interesting. Who paid for all this? You know, it takes money to print um, books, to organize seminars, to pay for lodging and food and all this. Uh, so Freemasons and communists probably footed the initial bill. But once the Vatican was taken over, they had a, like a pot of gold, uh, the uh, Vatican Bank. So it's so secretive. There's no records of it. No law agency in the world can even oversee it. They have unlimited funds, so, and the money is untraceable, so it really helps out. So here's where Freemasons, communists, and modernists work together to destroy the church. You know, they're, they're trying to do it, but they know they're, even the devil knows their goal will never be achieved. So we see the apostasy, the forces of hell with their accomplices on earth, and they accomplished a lot. But think of the courage, as the priest before me mentioned, of all of you and all the people throughout the world they are keeping the faith. So God will be with his church till the end of the world. Let's go into, this is where the charts are important, the management. Like uh, New Church, the CEO would be the modernist false popes, the board of directors, the cardinals, managers, the bishops, specialists, the theologians, PR people, the rectors and professors, store managers, the priest. I mean, you know, it's all ready to go. You just put in new management, and it's all ready to go. Now, this is how it took place. Infiltration, offer counterfeits, arouse interest, recruit helpers, indoctrinate. The most important thing is keep people confused. If people are confused, they don't know what to do, and, you know, you got them. Okay, this is quickly here. There's six abbeys where liturgical experimentation took place. Um, those are six of the main ones. Now, look at all these training camps the modernists had. Uh, they didn't call them that, but uh, they're all over the world. And Benedictines, known for the liturgy, Jesuits and Dominicans for their theology. Uh, Levain is very important. Belgium was the nerve center of most of this. Everything kind of went out of Levain. Okay, the movements, quickly. Pius XII established new feasts. The, the, the communion fast is mitigated, evening masses. So modernists started their own liturgical movement. They, they call it liturgical experimentation. They had a bunch of fronts, okay? The church was promoting scripture. Uh, there's really no such thing as a liturgical movement, though, because the liturgy is the same. It just gets embellished. It's kind of like a diamond that it just gets different things with it, but it is not a movement, okay? In scripture, they started skepticism. The church was promoting fathers of the church, their teachings, and then... The modernists used it as an excuse to change everything. Catholics are working for converts. Um, modernists for ecumenism. So real quickly, these are the heresies of Vatican II. Can you go up just a hair? Um, there you go. Perfect. Mice. Mice. Yeah. Modernism, indifferentism, collegiality, and ecumenism. So if you don't want to... Somebody says, why aren't you going along with Vatican II? You say mice. So... Modernism, it's a church with no rules. Do it yourself. So St. Pius X condemned that in Pascendi. Indifferentism, one religion goes another. Syllabus of Errors condemned at Pope Pius IX. Collegiality is the bishops really run the church. 
the Pope is just a PR guy, and that's the Vatican Council of 1869-1870 condemned that. Ecumenism, all the gods are the same. Pope Pius XI condemned that, Mortalium Animos. And antiquarianism, a return to ancient practices, Pope Pius XII condemned that, Humani Generis. False religious liberty is condemned by Pope Leo XIII. So uh, some people say, are you with the Pope? We're with the Popes, you know, and that's a good way of saying it. Okay, here's American modernists. Uh, there's a lot more. These are the main ones. Um, you wonder, um, Archbishop Sheen, what's he doing up there? Well, he ended up being an ecumenist 20 years after what Father Dominic quoted um, he was promoting ecumenism, and his was the, the way Vatican II was supposed to be interpreted, kind of. That was the role model of the parish in Rochester, how ecumenism was. So he kind of lost his faith. You can keep him in your prayers, but he did fall. Um, and uh, these other, Helen, and you don't hear a whole lot, but he helped destroy the new mass. Dearden, somebody called him a Judas once, um, and... Uh, Spellman just kind of let things going. He helped promote religious liberty, and once the Americans fell, it back into everybody fell. Belgians, uh, most of the people here you're not familiar with, but these are some of the most important people at Vatican II. Sunens was the one of the moderators of Vatican II. He really controlled a lot. Uh, he helped destroy the nuns throughout the world. And then um, Phillips uh, was person he should get a um, statue erected to him he did more back into it anybody and he was on the doctrinal committee as an undersecretary or secretary so he knew exactly what the traditional bishops were doing during that whole time and so he was like a spy he played both ways so French there's a lot of them so help change the new mass um, a lot of these people so we'll keep going there uh, Freemason Leonard we got a couple Freemasons and the Italians here Bunini and Rampola. Okay, we keep going. There's Germans. There's a lot of them there. And the Dutch. So the Belgians and Dutch had somebody on almost every committee at Vatican II. A lot of people. The new book's going to have a biography of all those people that you see. So you're going to know about 150 modernists and what they did and all these people ahead of time. Okay, even in, uh, keep going here, we've the uh, European modernist. Uh, this one guy is a communist plant from everything I can find out. And uh, Helder Camara is very important. He got the South American bishops, and so did Enriquez, to go follow the modernists. And then he was very influential in Asia, and he was very influential in Africa for the whole country to go. Now, here's in a nutshell how everything happened in Vatican II. Found this chart in a couple books, and it's really excellent. Uh, there's something called Delmas Maria Leonard, a Freemason in France, had Etch and Gary try to get all these bishops together. So there were bishop conferences all over the world. There's more bishops back into from the U.S. than any place else. Canada was a close second, it looks like. And um, so what they did is they um, got all these people to join, and then they gave them uh, weekly newsletters. They had the modernists give them indoctrination classes. And um, so they ended up 1,800 bishops from around the world uh, followed modernism. So let's go from there. Okay, this is what Vatican II on paper looked like. Basically a chain of command, the false popes, council fathers, you know, that's how it's supposed to be. Uh, it shouldn't be false popes, it just should be popes, but uh, moderators, coordinating committee. Then you have the presidents, uh, count the um, commissions, theological experts, non-Catholic observers. They're just supposed to be observers. But what really happened, uh, the next page, is the theological experts, they were number one. They told the bishops what to do. They wrote the decrees, and the moderators kept everything going. And the non-Catholic observers, they worked real close with all these people. So um, kind of interesting. The council fathers, they were just supposed to approve everything and mass, and that's what they did. Like I said, once U.S. fell, and it would have been about November 21st or so, 1962, everything fell over its dominoes. So... Real briefly with the Mass. Okay, that is God's masterpiece, the holy sacrifice of the Mass, and this major elements, offertory, consecration, communion. It's renewable in an unbloody manner, the sacrifice of our Lord on the cross. But it's been attacked for centuries. So let's go on down. Um, this is common traits for those who oppose the liturgy. 
Uh, Guerra J um, wrote these down. Baron Garris, Wycliffe, Busser, Calvin, Cramner, Carl Stan, Luther, Melanchthon, Zwingli, all these people hated the Mass. They detested the traditions of the Mass, rejected the papacy, shortened ceremonies, removed the supernatural, scorned Mary and the saints, eliminated prayerful atmosphere, translated ceremonies into the vernaculars and all the other things. Okay, here's, these changes aren't that new. Jansen has had them and so did the Vatican, the Protestant Reformation. The table, universal priesthood of laity, remove tabernacles, eliminate sacrificial character of the offertory, communion in the hand. Paraphrase the Last Supper, you're never reenacting it. That's why it's invalid. And they don't have a valid priesthood, rewrite the missals. And here's an interesting mass from the 1700s, before any of our time. Um, they had a priest processed in a simple altar preceded by a server carrying the cross. They alternated prayers with the people. He sat on the epistle side, read an oration. Following the glory and cradle, the laity brought bread, wine, fruit to the altar. And they were offered by the priest. Layman then brought an unveiled chalice to the priest and the deacon who were reciting prayers in a loud voice. The priest read the canon in a loud voice and they blessed fruit and vegetables on the altar. So we don't do that today. While the choir sang the Sanctus and on you stay. So Pope Pius VI condemned that and about this faith community stuff. And then the thing is getting God out of the picture. So basically uh, I thought this was kind of interesting here. Worship in the future will be marked rather by the self-conscious awareness that all of us are and can be God-bearers. Worship will not be oriented toward an external God, but toward the world of our human community. So that's from a book called Why Christianity Must Change or Die. So here's the pieces. How did all this come into being? Basically, you get enough people and you get them spread all over the world. It's not too hard. And uh, basically... They were working on this since the 20s, since the 1900s. So that basically you pull out your blueprints and you're ready to go. Okay, we'll go through here. The modern is this liturgical institutes. You bypass the Vatican by just call it a liturgical institute. Do all kinds of stuff. You know, write the new mass, do the sacraments. So that's what they were doing for about 30, 40 years before Vatican II. Here's some American modernist. Um, actually, Budweiser gets involved here. Uh, this Bush is related to Anheuser Busch, so uh, they help get the liturgical press. Now, if you drink a Budweiser, it doesn't mean you're a modernist. But uh, so he got it going with Michelle. But this is how all the literature got going. So uh, all these people did a lot. Uh, we'll keep going here because there's a lot of people. Bowden did a lot to get the new mass going in uh, Belgium. And look at all the different people here. Cardinal Mercier. Uh, shielded a lot of modernists from the Vatican. Jungman and Parsh, okay. Uh, Jungman was interesting. He wanted parts of the Mass to vanish, like prayers for the altar, the uh, con second confidior, last gospel, and they did. He wanted to protect an armor taken off. Okay, Parsh, let's go on the next page. It was kind of interesting. He had a special Hollywood type Mass in 35. So the bells rang, and then they had uh, all these people coming in uh, with a cross and torchbearers, 50 choir members, white tunics. Uh, they sang the Kyrie and Gloria while the president was seated. Layperson read the prayer. Then the presider and candle bearers went to the pulpit. He read the gospel in German. Uh, the bells rang. Uh, they had the cradle and offertory procession. This doesn't sound too wild, but... Um, then um, we read the prayers of the canon aloud. Now this after the Our Fathers, look at this. The table facing the people was cleared, prepared like a banquet, with candles, two wine glasses, and plates. The pox was given, laity approach, receive communion standing, and take a sip of wine afterwards. So kind of the new bass back in 35. So, okay, and then there was the German modernist. So a lot of these guys, uh, this Maria Locke was uh, really important. Abbey, where they did a lot of liturgical experimentation. That's where the, the new mass. Uh, next one is interesting here, the French. Um, they're um, people you never heard of, this Guy or Genet. Um, they actually wrote, look how many sacraments they did. Initiation, uh, marriage, uh, got funerals, reconciliation. Um, he wrote most of the new mass. No, most people never heard of him. Uh, Goot was one of the most powerful people in the world. I don't know if I pronounced it right, but he's a Benedictine abbot. 
abbot, but he was head of all the Benedictines throughout the world. He was head of the Concilium that helped write the new Mass, and he also uh, ended up being head of the Congregation of Divine Worship. So there's nobody in the world was more powerful than him. Here's uh, some liturgical conferences. Look at this in the 50s. You know, they have concelebration and active participation in the liturgy, modern man in the Mass. So they were starting to get some changes going. Pope Pius the Twelfth um, attended one that was in Rome. It started in Assisi, and um, so it was. Uh, we can keep coming down here. Okay, they wanted to change it to a three-year calendar, and the Rome said no. They wanted to take out the have offertory procession prayers for the altar. Rome said no. So after Pius the Twelfth uh, died, they changed it. So uh, we can keep coming down. Uh, so what they did, they had a liturgical conference in Assisi, 56. All these guys are modernists. Jungmann, Capel, Guerlier, Wagner, Bea, Rouguet, Rousseau, Garon, Spubeck. These are the guys that gave the talks. All of them were modernists. There were two of them that weren't modernists, and Pope Pius XII gave the closing talk. They hid themselves for most of it, but they were um, pretty, they were there. So the things were really close. So Pope Pius XII, he condemned antiquarianism, denial of the real presence, universal priesthood of believers. What he said, the Mass is directed toward God, his service, and his glory. And he said all the doctrines of the Church are enshrined in the Mass. So then we'll go real quickly on the liturgical commission and subcommission. This happened after Vatican II. There's a lot of different names for these. These guys are all modernists. You'll see these names keep popping up over and over. Okay, Sacred Congregation of Rights, that was supposed to be the watchdog to protect the faith. They just fizzled it out. They had the concilium take its place, and that was supposed to bring about the changes of Vatican II. Okay, we can keep going. Okay, and so the concilium uh, commission on uh, the liturgy got all the power to do what it wanted. So there were about uh, 200 people in it. Really, there were about 50 regular members. 30 of them attended the meetings, had all kinds of consultors. But look at all these same. This is interesting here. You know, they're taking uh, Jesus' seamless robe and they're throwing dice to see who's going to get what. So Jungman got the Mass, these two, the sacraments. This is how everything changed. Okay, next page we'll cover study group 10. Okay, here's members of the Concilium. Okay, and okay, group 10. Most of these people you're not familiar with, but that's, that's who wrote the New Mass. And Sacred Congregation of Divine Worship, all these guys were pretty much modernists too. Cody, look at John Paul I, John Paul II, they were advisors. Um, okay, and then we had the Protestants. We had to get some extra help, so got to work with your Protestant friends here. So uh, if we can bring this up. These are the six. They didn't write the New Mass, but uh, C. Cugnani, the El Met, uh, uh, Meto, um, El A-M-E-L-O, whatever, M-L-O, I think his name is, um, Sikagnani, told them, there were two of them, his brother died before and was against all this, uh, so he had these guys help out. Okay, we can go on the next page. Then we had a three-year calendar, so uh, everything was worked out that way. Uh, this is interesting here, this is the best part here. Could we go up just a hair? Um, this is from Cardinal Antonelli, who was just up just a little bit. Okay, perfect. Okay, confusion. No one has any sense of the sacred and binding character of liturgical laws. Changes continue. Sometimes they're not clear. Other times they lack logic. In my opinion, this is because of deplorable system of experiments. They breach the dikes. Everyone acts arbitrarily. Uh, and they change everything. Desacralization. And they call it secularization. So, so what happened after Vatican II is everything got completely changed. And uh, look at what happened to the liturgy. I mean, all the beautiful ceremonies, the beautiful sacred vessels, vestments, all that stuff was just tossed out. And then you got pottery, glass, and pewter, cotton in place of linen for altar cloths, paraffin instead of beeswax. Let's give God, you know, the junk. I mean, the banal music instead of chant and polyphonic like Palestrina. Uh, but, you know, we're very fortunate we still have the valid mass and sacraments. Uh, the church is still here today. And, you know, all of us have been brought closer to God through the turmoil. So let us draw strength from the saints who went before us. And let's pray for 
final perseverance. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.